Hey, Ron, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast today. I want to say we got connected because you hit me up on LinkedIn and you were looking for uh, some contacts in uh, Latin America for this new graduate certificate program you have. Uh, and so I invited you to come on the podcast today to talk about it. So I'm really excited and uh, welcome. Thank you, Mickey. It's great to be here. I'm coming to you today from the land of Mumagi in uh, actually Guysborough County, Nova Scotia, since I'm on spring break from COGS. Yeah. And uh, we've started a new program at COGS probably the last uh, year trying to get the curriculum done on forest geomatics and biometrics technology. And it's a graduate certificate program and it's one year long. So we're quite excited about that. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Um, can you tell a little bit about the program, what it will entail? Like what are the courses going to be like? Certainly. Uh, the courses start out with a, uh, an introduction to kind of GIS for forestry. So we're actually uh, getting students to use data that they collect in our local uh, forest and uh, do analysis on that data. So we like to instill a gut instinct, a feel for what's right and wrong by getting them out working with their own data rather than using somebody else's. So we use all the latest tools uh, in terms of survey one, two, three, and field maps and various other uh, remote sensing uh, platforms, as well as GIS, to capture the data. Mm -hmm. And then we get into working with uh, a little bit on programming in R, just kind of getting them used to using the software. Because a lot of people I'm surprised uh, can coming from Australia and New Zealand, I guess we're it's more uh, prolific down there. There's not a lot of people using it here in Canada, at least yeah. uh, coming out of the universities, which is quite, quite interesting. So we uh, we're just kind of start them off with some introductory kind of concepts related to uh, forest biometrics and insuration. And uh, then in the second term, we really build up into working with LIDAR data. We actually just uh, signed an educational license agreement with Remsoft. So use their Woodstock tool and they actually get to build a forest model from scratch on a county of their choice in Nova Scotia and try to emulate some of the uh, current uh, forest practices that uh, are undergoing uh, kind of a revitalization in Nova Scotia here using the triad concept mm -hmm. of forest management. So, yeah. yeah, we're quite excited about it. Yeah, that sounds exciting. That sounds like everything that you need to learn in a you know a graduate certificate program uh it's a lot of everything that i do every single day as a consulting biometrician uh and many of those classes i didn't have you know on hand it was just learning kind of on my own so sounds fun you might uh get me signed up yeah we're hoping that uh, we get a good uh, turnout uh, this year for the program and we've got a tremendous amount of interest internationally uh probably 30 students internationally have applied to it and uh, not a lot as many uh, locally, which is probably related to the fairly strong job market at, at the moment. And mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting enough here in, um, at least in Eastern Canada, we find it cogs when the job market is quite strong, our enrollment kind of goes down a bit and then mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, the job market kind of weans off then we tend to get a lot more students. So for people that don't know, uh, myself included, how is the forest there? What is the forest type? What does it look like? Yeah, so we're predominantly um, a mixed wood uh, species forest on the mainland of Nova Scotia with, uh, you know, your traditional kind of hemlock, uh, red spruce, and um, white pine forest. And with uh, a lot of really um, interesting uh, management practices in the past that have caused uh, um, a lot of intolerant forest uh, to happen because of uh, clarifel harvesting. And then we got a pioneer kind of uh, establishment of uh, aspen and yellow birch and uh, really uh, a lot of red maple. So we've got that kind of. Uh, a mosaic going on and then if we get towards Cape Breton Island uh, we are into the traditional uh, balsam fir dominated forest with uh, a bit of spruce and then tolerant hardwoods in the lowlands so mm -hmm. really quite a, a varied uh, kind of uh, forest across the whole province. 
to be yeah. harmed in the end. Sounds like it. And how is the forest industry there? What is the you know predominant products, and you know what are people looking for? Yeah, before you know, uh, last probably ten years ago, we had three uh, pulp mills, and mm-hmm. now we only have one pulp mill, mm-hmm. which has made it a bit difficult for uh, getting rid of the low grade material, uh, mm-hmm. because we have a lot of small saw log uh, uh, sawmills, and mm-hmm. uh, so it, it's always uh, a balance trying to uh, manage that product uh, segregation between uh, the saw log and the pulp wood and there's a lot of work being done with the utilization around biomass now as well mm-hmm. so quite a hot topic here is it is probably in the southern u.s as well yeah well i think the similar issue i worked in norway for four years uh, for the norwegian government uh, whenever i finished my phd that was my first job outside of college and um, it was interesting there because they had invested heavily in like uh, specialty paper mills. So making paper for like newspaper print or magazines or whatever. Um, I think they had at the beginning of the century, like 11 or 12 paper mills and it had gone down to two by the, by 2020, uh, because nobody's picking up a newspaper or a magazine anymore. They're looking on their cell phones. So uh, I think you see pretty much across, you know, the world that um, pulp products for, uh, especially for paper purposes, are uh, really hitting the, the pulp market pretty hard right now. Uh, probably the only thing saving it is like container board or uh, cardboard for, you know, uh, packaging for shipping, Amazon and all of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I still like to have the feel of a good book in my hands, similar to you and your your bookshelf in the background there. Uh, just, there's nothing like the feeling of just opening it up and kind of uh, turning the pages through it. So uh, I still like uh, to feel paper that way. It, it's probably uh, when we moved to uh, digital music. So when we got away from records, you know, people said the soul of the music died. Having a book you know, you just have a little bit of the soul of the book there, but reading it on like, even like a Kindle, you don't get the same kind of feel. So I'm with you. Like, uh, I like to pick up a book, uh, whether it's a textbook or whatever it is, that really is what I want to, to use for reading purposes. Yeah. Uh, much the same. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, I have never been in your, uh, in your neck of the woods. I've actually never been to Canada outside of uh, British Columbia. So um, be interested to get up there some point and see what you're doing. Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting um, uh, area within Canada. It's very unique to maritime provinces. There's, mm-hmm. of course, a lot of the communities that are very closely related to uh, the fishing industry in the past. And so yeah. uh, apparently in Nova Scotia, you're only a half an hour away from uh, the ocean so that's what makes it quite quite unique yeah and uh, we have about 13 educational institutes so we have uh, lots of universities so sometimes that makes it difficult for students because we get a lot of them coming out to try to find work so Mm -hmm. they tend to populate the rest of Canada and and the U.S. as well yeah it's interesting uh how that dynamic works and I think that is also maybe worldwide that you know once you go to a university you tend to like the area and want to stay there so the surrounding area kind of just gets overpopulated with students and then the job market kind of isn't that great for you know new ones coming out who want to stick around um i find that uh when i go to universities here in the southeast um, to do recruiting or to go to career fairs or whatever that the students generally say, well, what do you have locally? And then, you know, I have to tell them my story, like, Hey, I'm from like rural East Texas, like from nowhere, you would never have heard of my town in your life. And then I've been all over the world to work. Like you need to get out and see something. That's how you learn something and get educated and know who you are and change your ideas on life. It's just so wonderful to get out and do something, you know, past the 30 mile radius around where you grew up. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't. I totally agree with you there, Mickey. I mean, I've uh, worked in the southern U.S. Uh, 
New Zealand, Australia, and, uh, you know, did a little bit of uh, work while I was doing my PhD to just to earn ex some extra cash, like all students yeah. do in, in Ireland. So, uh, oh, cool. it's, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I guess the most interesting thing, not only working with, uh, different forest types and whatnot is the working with the different people. That's where you mm -hmm. really, really appreciate, uh, that, uh, different points of views and opinion that, you know, you really wouldn't, uh, be able to, to uh, uh, if you stayed in one area, so it really mm -hmm. opens up your mind. Uh, like everything in forestry, there's many ways to uh, to skin the cat. Yeah, exactly. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into you know biometrics and measurements and inventory and all of that? I mean, obviously you you started at some point and you weren't in forestry and then you liked it. So how did that happen? Yeah, so I guess I started out, uh, I grew up in, uh, actually, where I'm uh, talking to you from today, which is quite ironic since I've been around the world a lot, mm -hmm. um, in Guysborough, Nova Scotia, and uh, my family was in the uh, sawmilling industry, actually, mm -hmm. so that, and uh, worked a lot in the Christmas tree industry as well here in Nova Scotia, and, uh, you know, I was always interested in mathematics and geography uh, in uh, high school. And I, oh, I say, ah, oh, you know, I'd love to be able to apply what I'm what I'm interested in in uh, high school to the forest industry. So mm -hmm. um, when I I decided to go to ATU and be in Fredericton in the uh, mid '80s and study forestry there, and I studied under uh, Mark Jaminick and uh, my TA actually in uh, forest optimization was Carl Walters. So, uh, yeah, so I kind of I really kind of took to uh, the spatial modeling end of things and uh, built kind of the first linear program uh, applied to the Christmas tree industry here in Canada. So uh, and then it just kind of accelerated after that. I uh, went went uh, out to British Columbia like a lot of Maritimers do and uh, studied uh, uh i guess studied and worked uh, in the same way in with the bc forest service and uh like all uh maritimers after spending five years away decided to um, migrate back to nova scotia and work with the canadian model forest network and got involved with uh, the state of the forest reporting and that sort of thing and did a little bit of woodstock modeling and mm -hmm. quite enjoyed that and then uh, uh I got called up by store Enzo one day and in, in here in Port Hawkesbury, which is only a half an hour away from my home. And I got a job doing wood supply modeling and GIS and that sort of thing. And, uh, previous to that, when I was in BC, I did study GIS at, uh, out there at a small college in Prince George, BC and uh you know, worked uh, about four or five years and then i guess like a lot of mills in the northeast and the paper mills that was the start of things uh, starting to decline and uh, margins were decreasing so at that point in time i looked at uh said, you know i'd really be interested in learning a lot more about financial modeling because in any of the uh training that uh, we had uh, with uh, ramsoft we had a lot of models that were really from all around the world. And uh, I said, that would be interesting. So I happened to just uh, apply on a few jobs uh, in uh, the southern U.S. and ended up working with Gulf States Pulp and Paper. Oh. And uh, really quite enjoyed uh, my time down there, even though it was only a few years. But uh, I really uh, enjoyed looking at the financial aspect of uh, forestry, maximizing net present value and working with Loblolly Pine and, and mm -hmm. it was quite interesting. And then, of course, the global fi financial crisis came along and I said, mm -hmm. oh, where is there a safe spot in the world? And uh, and then finally, I, I saw this job in Australia working with, uh, they wanted to do some Woodstock modeling and implement a GIS system. And, uh, I said, oh, that, you know, that would be kind of cool. I should just throw my name into the hat. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I just happened to get a, get a call from uh, a company called Vic Forest and uh, started working in the, the in uh, eucalyptus uh, uh, 
sawmill uh, industry down there. So it's their high quality uh, eucalyptus um, regnans, mm -hmm. which is also known as mountain ash down there. And uh, yeah, really worked there for four or five years. We brought in the um, what's now known as uh, the Trimble um, product uh, uh, land resource manager. Mm -hmm. Sinchia back then and, and really got introduced to using Stanley and uh, Woodstock and doing some action and uh, maximizing uh, NPV and uh, we were uh, filled up some work with a great group of people from New Zealand and uh, South Africa so it was really my start to kind of my global journey yeah. in forestry yeah and then uh, yeah and then migrated up to work with the Hancock organization in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And that was tremendous, a great experience working. We actually used a program there called Tiger Moss. So I actually had to get outside of my uh, comfort zone from using the Remsoft products. And uh, that was um, that was quite interesting. We had managed 20 different species up there. So wow. you know, where else could we kind of go in uh, uh, four or five years and learn all about 20 different species in one company in one area. So I thought that was a very unique opportunity and working with uh, literally people from Eastern Europe, uh, the United States, uh, New Zealand, Australia, you name it. So it was, you know, as I said before, working with all those people was the best part of the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and at that time I, Kind of got into the lidar bug like a lot of foresters did and decided uh, an opportunity came up at ubc to start my phd and so kind of worked in growth and yield and uh, machine learning and that stuff and been trying to integrate those back into the wood supply modeling process and uh, mm -hmm. yeah so um, just kind of did some consulting over COVID and whatnot and um and now uh an opportunity came up here to work at COGS, and so that's where I'm at now, and uh, finishing up my PhD, just getting my publications for the journal, so that'll be done in the next few weeks. So, yeah, it's been quite a journey part-time uh, in Australia doing that. Yeah. And well, that, the blues. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. You've had, a, you've had a lot going on in your career so far, and before you finish your PhD, um, Tell me in uh, in UBC, like who are you studying with, and what are you what are you working on? What is your oh? So when I was out at UBC, I worked with uh, uh, Nicholas Coops and mm -hmm. uh, B uh, Bianca. I can't remember all the last names now. Yeah. Like Valerie Lemay. Yeah. So it's kind of the group that kind of introduced me to the biometrics end of things and working with our. And I'd taken a few courses before with David Larson and mm. uh, online so mm -hmm. so I said I was kind of interested in that that sort of thing and I worked with a couple of consulting companies on a project that was related to my PhD and so uh, that was quite interesting being able to on a day-to-day -day basis kind of help somebody else else out while you're kind of studying as well so mm -hmm. uh, yeah that was really uh, really a fascinating time so uh, I'm a little bit confused. You're getting your PhD from UBC currently? No, or you... I, my coursework at UBC, and then I moved back to Australia. And I yeah. have to, I did my PhD down there with the University of Queensland. And I have a couple of advisors that actually happened to be at the University of Maine uh, in the past. And so it just happened to be fortuitous. They also went to UNB that we could yeah. look it up. So uh, yeah, yeah it's cool. that way. And I've taken a, a few other kind of courses uh, related to biometrics uh, and specific areas that I'm studying. I'll just kind of randomly take a course in New Zealand or something like that. So uh, it's been quite a quite an interesting being able to get different perspectives on using biometric techniques from all over the world. I wish there was uh, more opportunity for that kind of cross uh, university collaboration where you could take courses here and there. I mean, there's just like, you know, the experts in any particular field are not at usually at the same place. They're all over the world. And uh, it would be nice to, you know, 
obviously you take your modeling courses from whatever statistics program or whatever, but then you, if you could have the opportunity to take courses with specific people in different places, that would be awesome. Uh, I'm thinking of, um, you know, for example, um, oh, I don't have a good example. Uh, we go to Georgia to do harvest scheduling, for example. Uh, I think that would be great. They have some very, uh, I just read a recent paper from, uh, uh, Georgia, where they're including terminal values into um, harvest schedule decision making. And I thought, man, I really want to go take a course with this guy. Um, <laughs> so uh, you've uh, obviously had a, a very interesting and fruitful uh, career path that's let you uh, study at these different universities. Yeah, I mean, what really what started out was there was an, the first online master's program in forestry that I'm aware of was at Mississippi State, and yeah. I studied under Donald Grebner there, yeah. and uh, I worked on a problem related to uh, integer programming in, uh, uh, in modeling uh, some operational and tactical planning in uh, Australia. So, yeah. so that was that really was kind of before his time. And, you know, I think during COVID, definitely uh, the online learning environment has uh, blossomed a lot more and probably wouldn't, we wouldn't be today uh, with, with, without it. There's a lot of things that have really, in, in some ways, improved as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. So even though there's a lot of negative things that happened, there's a lot of positive things that come out of it, like, the ability to do um, a lot more uh, podcasts and using teams and stuff where we not only use them casually before, but now it's enabled a, a great deal more collaboration than I think we've had in the past. Yeah. And I don't know why we were so uh, adverse to doing, you know, this kind of online uh, uh, collaboration through Teams or Zoom or Google Hangout or whatever it was. Um, because it just works so well. <laughs> Maybe we were just not, you know, dipping our toes in the water before COVID and then it kind of forced us to do it. And we we're like, oh, hey, this is great. Uh, but it really works. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I think sometimes too in the past, you know, the technology has improved a lot. I remember the first time using it when I was doing some work in New Zealand, we were communicating with some colleagues in India and the connection was so poor. And I said, I don't know if this team's, is thing is going to make it. <laughs> I guess I uh, I was wrong there. It uh, certainly yeah. did, and uh, it's made a, a big difference in the, yeah. the standard work life today. I actually moved back to uh, the southern U.S. in the summer of 2020, so I, I changed jobs in the middle of COVID. Um, I remember I arrived here when the masking requirements was not even implemented yet. So there were still no masking requirements when I arrived. Um, that's how early on in the pandemic it was. And, um, but I spent my entire first year, like coming to my office, closing the door, not talking to anyone except through Teams. Like even in the same building, just like Teams in each other because we weren't trying to get anyone sick. Yeah, it was an interesting time, but it oh, worked. Yes. I remember when uh, I had one meeting not too long, recently, most recently with a forester in uh, the U.S. that I visited, and, you know, at, at that point, he was uh, doing something on his computer, and I was in the corner of his office uh, using a laptop, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's still a bit of uh, anxiety out there, I guess, uh, still yeah. related to COVID. Uh, yeah. A majority of us have been vaccinated. Well, I guess for uh, the majority of foresters, it wasn't a problem because they were just going to the woods anyway and happy to be there. But for those of us that needed to sit behind a computer and be in an office, it was a, you know, it was a little bit of a hectic period, but we figured it out. And then a lot of people started working from home and we figured out we could do that also um, really well. Uh, so the need for being in an office building, I think, is also going away. Yeah, for myself, I actually was very lucky at the time. I was in uh, Torquay in Australia, mm -hmm. and I was working for a company called Midway there. And I was doing inventory work, uh, 
50% of the time and office work the other 50% of the time, but it really didn't impact my life since I was just outside of the city border of Melbourne and uh, restrictions weren't quite as um, uh, strong as they were uh, elsewhere in Australia. So um, yeah, it, it didn't really uh, change my life that much. And I think we had seven cases of COVID in that area in the non-entire pandemic. So yeah. The only good thing was the place I was living in happened to be a resort and everybody left. So I was <laughs> myself there in a 200 place resort next to the ocean. So, yeah, I was sad when everybody came. Back. I bet. <laughs> Sounds like you were living the dream for a little bit. Yeah, I was. The dream was <laughs> for like a lot of people for a while and then reality came back fairly quickly. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, Australia. Um, how long did you live there? And, you know, what, yeah. how was it? Uh, 15 years, really. Uh, I'm with little short breaks here and there. And uh, I'm really quite an amazing uh, society. Um, you know, uh, Australia is uh, kind of a, a, the promised land, so to speak, in the sense that uh, they haven't really had a major downturn uh, until just recently. Um, somewhat related to uh, the ability of um, uh, trade with uh, China and the iron ore, but uh, generally those minerals have kind of kept their society going quite well. So they have very unique uh, social programs there. For example, every Australian gets the same number of holidays a year. Mm -hmm. So uh, everybody gets four weeks starting out, so uh, which is quite nice. And uh, they have a very unique uh, superannuation fund, which is similar to a 401k, where generally uh, everybody gets between 9.5% and 17% of your gross salary added on to your paycheck. And that's kind of put away in a, uh, in a, um, a superannuation fund. So they have uh, some really unique uh, things in their, in their society that have... It makes it quite quite a great place to to work, and uh, like I said, it's very multicultural. So, just working with foresters and different uh, specialists from all over the world uh, makes it quite fantastic, and uh, a wider range of of ecosystems. And I thought when I went down there, oh, it's always so it will be so flat, and there's just kangaroos everywhere. But it right. actually. There's some fairly steep slopes uh, next to the coast and uh, lots of uh, blackberries and uh, mm -hmm. raspberries to contend with. Yeah. <laughs> and what is, uh, I know they grow a lot of eucalyptus, but what other forest types are down there? Yeah, one of the unique things when I used to work at Hancock uh, in Queensland, uh, they grow uh, a native, it's the only native plantation species in Australia, and it's called hoop pine. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's from the uh, genus Ericaria, and so it's also found in Papua New Guinea and I think a few places in South America. But uh, mm -hmm. very unique uh, preservatives in it, and actually it was uh, used to make uh, uh, cribs. Uh, so oh, maybe so that's one of its top top things as well, and some musical instruments as well. Mm -hmm. uh, used from it. so that was quite unique. But you know, a wide variety of um, of course. Pinus radiata across, that's kind of the, the majority of the softwood species would be uh, Pinus radiata plantations. We mm. didn't have much of those up in Queensland. Up there, it was more of a Caribbean pine slash pine hybrid. Mm. So uh, that was quite fascinating. But of course, they had tremendous other types of species and uh, different types of uh, uh, blue gums and... Uh, and uh, a wide variety of um, other uh, unique hardwood species. So, uh, yeah, quite quite fascinating, actually. A lot of different types of silviculture interventions in there as well. Yeah, is it uh, mostly just traditional plantation forestry where you're, you know, thinning rows and growing to an optimal rotation length, or is it uh, uneven aged, or how does it work? Um, no, a lot of it in, the, especially in the pine plantations, your traditional um, maybe one one thinning or a single uh, or a single clear fell. Mm -hmm. um, what's unique about uh, Queensland is, um, even though it's as bigger than Texas, it uh, 
it, some of the areas are very remote, so it's hard to uh, get, um, how should we say, uh, con different uh, contractors in to do some of the uh, interventions, even though some of the MAIs are quite high up in the northern part. We, there is also a risk of cyclone activity. So some of the stands are probably managed suboptimally, I guess, compared to what you could be. But given the fact it's, it's very difficult to find the labor to do those uh, interventions, uh, you probably don't get as uh, high of MPVs that you could potentially get. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh the infrastructure is very important and i think you know probably growing up in canada and the us we um kind of take it for granted sometimes because we have such a good infrastructure i know in my travels i've seen plenty of places where it's like the forest industry could be great here i'm thinking uh, specifically in my travels across latin america where you get um, not very good road infrastructure for example um, Colombia, where my wife is from, is a very mountainous country, and I remember driving on the roads there and looking up and down the mountain and going, man, this is some good timber, and it grows fast, obviously, but then you're, you know, three hours later, you move from this side of the mountain to this side of the mountain, and you're going, I was there three hours ago, you know, <laughs> so it's like, how could you uh, reliably get that timber to any kind of mill or any kind of port, um, and then reasonable amount of time um yeah uh, yeah it's i guess that's kind of the big difference i found between australia and new zealand new zealand mm -hmm. they're well connected with railroad infrastructure mm -hmm. road infrastructure and uh the distance to the ports are much less they're able to get the product out uh, much more cost effectively and mm -hmm. uh, of course they have the magic growing conditions the volcanic soils and mm -hmm. lots of rain and uh, a long history of genetic improvement uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Pinus radiata. So, you know, you're very commonly you'll get MAIs in the 30 meters cubed to the hectare out there where, you know, in Australia, you know, we kind of struggle around the 20 to 25 mm -hmm. uh, optimally to, uh, to get it in, uh, in uh, the similar uh, species there. And, uh, I wonder how it is being a field forester in Australia, because what we hear here is everything is trying to kill you. Well, you know, I've been out a bit in Australia and uh, I've never really uh, encountered a, a snake, uh, mm. that, uh, you know, that was poisonous. So it's very, very rare. And, you know, we all wear snake chaps like you do in the southern U.S. to get protect yourself from, uh, of course, you have rattlesnakes down there, but we have, uh, you know, brown snakes, tiger snakes, and some of them are the most poisonous in the world, but you just kind of just get along uh, with things, and uh, mm -hmm. they, they you tend to stay out of their way as best as you can, and they, they tend to stay out of uh, yours. Uh, you know, I'm, one, one interesting encounter I did have wasn't with a poisonous snake, but was with a, uh, uh, basically what they call a, a carpet uh, python mm. and I was having lunch just sitting uh, like most foresters do at lunchtime on the back of the pickup and then all of a sudden all I saw was this head of this massive snake come across the road and literally it stretched from one side of the <laughs> road to the other it just kind of went up uh, went up uh, the other side of the bank and I said, Oh, that was that was interesting. It, it was a good story to tell after that. Yeah, I I've never encountered a snake in the forest, only outside the forest, like you just described on the road. I remember one day I was going back to my work vehicle and I was taking my step. That would be my last step on the ground before I got in the work vehicle. And right below where my foot was, was a big head of a very black snake. Um, it ended up being a rat, what we call a rat snake locally. But it, I stepped back, moved around, went to the other side of the vehicle to get in. And the thing stretched across the entire length of the vehicle. It was the width of the vehicle. So it must have been like six feet wide at least, and or long at least. And I was like, man, that's crazy. I about had a really bad time there. And of course, it, there, it wasn't poisonous, but still it would have uh, 
I would have been shaking for quite some time. <laughs> well, the one interesting thing that I ran into there once, I was kind of leaning up against a tree in uh, Queensland, just taking a break from the uh, midday sun, and I felt something on the back of my neck, and I was almost too scared to turn around to see what it was. Right. But I did turn around, and I for a while I actually couldn't see what it was. But it was the uh, it was a, uh, a igu iguana, and it all it camouflaged, camouflaged itself to almost look like the tree. But it was yeah. just of its tail that was tickling against the back of my neck. <laughs> so I count myself lucky on that one. It wasn't something else. Yeah, right. Um, about the worst encounter I've had is you know you've been in the you know, the plantation forests in the southern U.S. where the, the blackberry and the briars, they just get pretty bad. So sometimes you go in just like ready for war. You got your, you know, thick clothing on no matter how hot it is outside and you're wearing gloves and you got, you know, hats on. And so like the only exposed part of your body is like from your neck up. And I got the first uh, fire ant bite on my neck. And then I realized that I had been standing too long in a fire ant mound and I was completely covered in fire ants. And so then I'm just like, you know, at that point, the blackberry didn't seem so bad. So <laughs> I'm throwing everything off, trying to get out of there. And it's like, you don't want the first one to get you on the neck. No, I, was no. Covered. I experienced yeah. that once in the, uh in Alabama and I don't want to experience those again. It, that taught me not to wear sandals uh, when you're gardening. <laughs> right. It's a good experience. But, uh, you know, the blackberry bushes are, you know, in um, southeastern Victoria are just notorious because we get a lot, of, uh, a lot of rain down there around the Great Ocean Road. And I had one grad student with me one day and she was yelling to me and I said, where are you, Jin Ling? And she was actually, she was about four and a half uh, feet tall and literally covered by blackberries. And we had to, she had a machete to chop her way through it. It was just unbelievable how thick it was. There. Yeah. And you want to get it when it's green because the dried out blackberry, it doesn't matter how long you cut it, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> So that was a new uh, a new experience in doing forest inventory yeah. uh, plots in the blackberries of uh, yeah. southeastern Australia. Yeah, that's cool. Um, well, it sounds like it was a fun experience. Uh, I know that they do a lot of uh, good biometrics work down there too. I know a few of the. I've been fortunate enough to meet a few of them at conferences. Um, were you involved with uh, Peter West, for example? Did you know him? Yeah, I knew Peter from up in uh, Lismore there, so uh, we actually chatted a bit. Uh, I was looking for a, a, a book when I kind of just started out, and I actually was able to purchase a book from Peter there on uh, biometrics related to uh, some species in Australia. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of interesting people in the biometrics. Not a lot of them. It's a tight-knit bunch, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's a... Uh, very good to, to meet a few of them uh, while I was down there between New Zealand and Australia. Yeah, it's really interesting to see also what they're doing. I think in just in, you know, undergraduate forestry, uh, at least my experience was we didn't hear too much about what was going on in other parts of the world. Uh, but when you get into grad school and then you start reading the papers from everywhere and you start seeing uh, them tackle the same problems, but a little bit differently. And it's interesting to see those different approaches. Um, and it's interesting to see why that they would take that a different approaches, because the problem, while similar, it's just a little bit different. It's not the same. Not everybody's growing love all the pie, and I have to tell that to myself, because, of course, that's what I work in. Um, but it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it was very interesting. I remember that my first stint in New Zealand, we... And, in terms of canned in the U.S., when we talk, we talk about stratification and in terms of modeling and whatnot, and they were referred to as crop typing mm -hmm. in, uh, in New Zealand. So uh, often, sometimes, we, we talk about the same thing. We just use different terms, and it's just getting used to the, the yeah. jargon, so to speak, uh, in, uh, in that area. Yeah. 
Uh, I described uh, to my international colleagues, I had described southern, uh, southern U.S. plantation forestry as uh, basically the same concept as growing corn. It's just not grown annually. <laughs> so <laughs> we put them in the ground in rows and we grow them up and then we take them down when they're ready. Yeah, or just, just on a different rotation. Exactly. Well, tell me a bit, because you've worked a lot of time with RimSoft. I, um, I had some experience with uh, RimSoft uh, in my master's degree. So we're talking 2008, 2010. But since then, I haven't really used it. Um, but you've been using it for quite a long time. So can you tell a little bit about you know, the changes that you've seen over time and its capabilities? Yeah, I guess the biggest change that uh, I've seen is its use in operational planning and tactical planning. It's really, uh, they put a large amount of investment in and uh, looking at using um, different uh, machine learning techniques to kind of predict uh, some of the uh, times to uh, harvest based on previous harvesting uh, of blocks and whatnot to try to uh, reduce the amount of manual uh, work that you have to do in uh, setting up a, a short-term harvest schedule. So there's been some really interesting things in that uh, the spatial uh, ability to do blocking and, and mixed integer programming has really improved and you know in Australia and New Zealand specifically it's we use that a lot for doing uh, uh, tactical planning where in the past when you know, on the speed, of course, with the computers today, we can generate that in in a very short order of time compared to, I remember the first time that I was talking to colleagues in Alabama and uh, some mixed integer programming that they're doing now and down there took uh, somewhere as two days to a week to run some models. So it's interesting to uh, see those things kind of come together. And uh, it's very interesting working with a lot of the growth in yield models in, from New Zealand. They have some very advanced uh, ones that have been built by a company called Interpine there. And uh, just some, being able to integrate those very quickly into uh, the regimes modules within uh, Woodstock, which we didn't have in the past, has been quite powerful as well. And we actually use regimes here in Nova Scotia to kind of set up our uh, irregular shelter wood prescriptions and brush pads. So, um, you know, it's great to be able to use the technology in uh, different parts of the world in different ways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, being able to explain that to students will be uh, quite fascinating as okay. well. Yeah. And, uh, just to show them that there's a number of different ways to use the, the software to solve problems. So, and yeah. of course, it's grown Hugely, the company only started out in a, in a small house in Fredericton with four or five guys that, uh, and now it's, uh, you know, 40 or 50 uh, people and it's a global company. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's great to see something locally uh, start from basic research uh, from a grad student, a couple of grad students, and then move up. And I guess that just shows you how much uh, basic research is, is needed and it has the potential to grow to greater things it just needs the right circumstances to blossom right it's nice to see uh at least some of those companies that have come along and that have grown i mean they obviously found uh the need uh for their product and they were able to develop and market it very well i mean the rimsoft software is probably the most uh known software worldwide for harvest scheduling right um, I, I, I don't know of one that is more well known than, than RimSoft. Um, but uh, we have a few new companies coming through that I think are doing excellent things, uh, not in hard scheduling, but at least in the inventory world. Uh, we see uh, companies making use of drones and of LiDAR. Um, one of the companies that I'm thinking about right now is TreeSwift. Have you heard of them? Yeah, I actually have heard of TreeSwift. Uh, it's uh they're doing a lot of uh, interesting things. I mean, I think that's really getting that quality information mm -hmm. is kind of the next generation that's coming along to really improve our modeling capabilities because 
a lot of times in the past, I'm sure you're not the only one to see, you know, oh, garbage in, garbage out, because we didn't have quite the quality of the models that they need for uh, doing the short-term planning. But mm -hmm. now we're going to have a lot of really high quality data. So it'll be hopefully our accuracy of our models and predictions will be much better than what they have been in the past. Right. Hopefully so. I think um, the amount of data that we're going to able to incorporate into our models is going to increase where before we might use you know height diameter side index or some measure of productivity now we're going to be able to add things like uh crown length and width and LA lai and all of those extra variables that can easily easily be captured using you know lidar and photogrammetry that uh, we couldn't use in the past because it was so complicated to measure whenever you're just a guy with a, you know, a hypsometer and a data recorder. Yeah, no, it's, um, that's going to be a, a really big part of our program here at Cogs as well as uh, being able to do a lot of uh, detailed mapping and building canopy height models with the LiDAR on the drone and mm -hmm. uh, stem counts for survival and whatnot. So, those are kind of a lot of the assessments that we're doing are really practical things that are going on in the forest industry today that uh, mm -hmm. they'll be able to utilize their skills in. It's just, you've got so many things to teach in such a short amount of time. Uh, it's mm -hmm. trying to uh, have that balance between what's uh, essential that they need to know and what's nice to know. Uh, yeah. I think also, um, coming out of a program like that, just being exposed to the ideas, having some experience with it is quite the most important thing. A lot of the the training that we do here on the job, it, it, it makes it so much easier when they've already experienced that versus getting someone who doesn't have that experience. So you mentioned earlier about using R. As an analyst now, almost everything is done in, in, in R, in forestry, R or Python. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not using, for example, SAS anymore. Uh, and many of the people coming out of universities were learning SAS because historically that was the statistical software. And guess what? They gave it free to universities to use. So therefore, you can use it there. Um, but when you come out, SAS is expensive. And I find it not as flexible as something like R or Python in doing the analysis that we need to do. Um, so it is infinitely more easy to teach somebody the work that they need to do if they already know how to use R or they've been exposed to it enough that they don't, you don't have to start from the beginning. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great, R is a great package. I'm just, I mean, other than biometrics, I've used it the functionality in GIS and remote sensing. So it has a wide range of applications. Mm -hmm. and, uh, interesting enough, uh, it, it came out of New Zealand, uh, the start of it. So uh, uh, that was yeah. quite, quite interesting. Uh, I didn't know that. So the original program was S. Uh, I don't know if that was the original. Uh, it might have uh, started somewhere before that. At least that's the one that I remember. Um, but I didn't realize it came out of New Zealand. That's interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, actually, I, I, I uncovered some code the other day that was uh, written in uh, starting out in S. And I said, oh, this is remarkably similar to yeah. Uh, R. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and then the other is the, um, you know, the, the measurements using, uh, you know, drones or some other, uh, whatever the sensor is on. So using LIDAR sensors, using photogrammetry sensors to capture data. Um, I know now in many universities, uh, people are getting exposed to that, but, you know, 10, 15 years ago, nobody was really. Uh, it was the one or two professors that had a you know, $100,000 unit uh, sitting in their closet that nobody got to touch except for them because it was so expensive and delicate. Oh, yeah. Like we use, we have a, um, the um, Matrice uh, 300 here and uh, some of the other uh, smaller drones uh, that we have at COGS. But uh, the, of course, the big thing is the camera. You know, you might pay 18000 or something for, uh, or the drone, but the cameras can be quite expensive, up to mm. seventy thousand or hundred thousand, depending on uh, what type of application you're using. So, um, 
it's always hard to get funding for some of those uh, more uh, expensive uh, cameras, but uh, there's extraordinary capability that we have now. And uh, one of the projects that uh, we were working on before was to actually uh, look at developing an inventory from the LiDAR imagery and totally automated inventory. COGS was one, one of the projects that, uh, that, uh, that the team here was working on. So uh, in comparing that to the current forest inventory that was developed, you know, some years back, we're using uh, the aerial imagery. So uh, it's quite interesting to see the, the amount of detail that you can get now. And it's just incredible. It's almost too much detail. Yeah, it's definitely big data. Um, there's just so much information that you can gather and quickly. And now that you know, space is still expensive, but not as expensive as it was. Uh, we have much more of it than we used to. Um, and so that uh, leads to our ability to capture more data and store it and store it almost indefinitely for when you need to go back and relook at things. I can only imagine the, um, the advances that will be made in technology in terms of the ability to process data and you know, being able to store data almost indefinitely. You can go back and use new algorithms and new machine learning methods or whatever to reevaluate data that you've had in the past. Whereas our traditional inventories that are, you know, tree diameter and height, um, not much more that we can do with that, <laughs> right? No, you're correct. Uh, I'm, I'm actually quite excited to where, where the uh, next journey takes us in this uh, digital revolution that we're mm -hmm. having forestry. Uh, the last five to 10 years have been absolutely fantastic. So I definitely see some uh, big gains, not only in the techniques, but uh, the hardware and software that go along with it. And it uh, be exciting to see the students uh, use that mm -hmm. and uh, generate some... Uh, high quality uh, uh, work for their assessments. And the unique thing about uh, at COGS is it's very applied and hands-on. So they, uh, or they actually will get to use those things that are, get them job ready. And so mm -hmm. they do a good job about recruiting there. And we had, last time we had a career fair and we had 40 different companies come into the, to the college uh, to recruit out of eight to ten different types of programs that we have here so yeah. there is the interest out there so we just hopefully uh, get all the students we need to kind of uh, progress forward yeah what uh it's a one-year program and it is on campus so there's no remote capabilities correct no not at the moment in terms of uh, the graduate certificate in forest biometrics and technology but we do actually have uh, portions thereof of courses and programs in uh, data science and uh, remote sensing that, and GIS that are actually online as well. So it's interesting teaching in those two types of environments, uh, online versus in person. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, no, um, we do try to, get, we have a wide range of students from uh, Africa to Southeast Asia a few from the United States and all across Canada that, that come to COG. So it's a unique uh, situation. There's a lot of work. There's, uh, it's not a, it's not a cakewalk, um, and that's why employers uh, like it because they know that the students are going to experience as close as they can to uh, the job while they're there. We're a very small town of only about 800 people, so there's not a lot of distractions other than studying. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to get to the forest and do something fun. Yeah, and we're only 100 meters from the forest, so uh, mm -hmm. it's it, we don't spend a lot of time traveling, although we do, we'll do. we get out to some of the other forest types that maybe aren't representative in the general area. But, uh, yeah. yeah, you're very close. Just uh, put your backpack on, your work boots, and, uh, and within uh, five minutes, you're ready to start... Uh, setting up a uh, forest inventory plot yeah cool 
what kind of uh, uh, assistantship or scholarship is available for students that would be interested? Yeah, that's a good thing to mention. We have a wide variety of uh, things through what's called the Forest Innovation Fund. Mm -hmm. So that that's essentially what kind of set up this program uh, from the Nova Scotia government. And they provide a wide range of scholarships uh, to a student that wants to study here at COG. So, um, you know, you can really do quite well with uh, with applying to these because there's lots of them available for uh, students that are from Canada. Okay. And for students specifically from Canada or what about internationally? Uh, there are a few uh, international ones, but the majority of ones, I think you, they're you have to be a, a Canadian uh, citizen to apply. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I forgot to mention, we do have an arrangement in, it's only unique to the Maritimes between uh, the Northeastern states, in particular Maine students can come here and uh, Canadian students that are from the Maritimes can study in Maine for the mm -hmm. same tuition fee. So uh, oh, okay. that's a unique kind of situation as well. I think, uh, during COVID, it started out with the Bachelor of Education programs in the past too, and it just spread from there. Yeah, that's nice. I I assume, uh, you know, while you're crossing an international border, just going like what would essentially be for us going the next state or the next county over, and then tuition going up <laughs> exponentially might be annoying. <laughs> Yeah, that's one good thing at COGS. The tuition rates are, are not as high as they are at some of the universities. So uh, mm -hmm. it's not an, uh, as big of an impediment as it had in the, been in the past. Our biggest thing, like in a lot of places, is the world is just trying to find a place to live in a small rural area. That's more the challenge uh, rather than mm -hmm. the actual cost of it uh, at the moment. Yeah, I didn't think about that. If it's only uh, 800 people, the, uh, <laughs> the we, do, we do have a residence that is built on campus that holds 40 students. So that has alleviated some of the issues. And mm -hmm. it's a brand new residence, uh, but a year and a half old. So um, that's helped out a lot. But we do have students that, you know, travel as upwards of 40 minutes to go to school uh, just to find housing. Yeah. it's not impossible but you have to do a little looking yeah well that's uh thank you for coming on the the podcast and talking about that and also talking about your career uh i hope we can get the word out and get it spread around and hopefully get you some more students to yeah, that'd be great, Nikki. thank you yeah. and uh next time i'm down in uh, alabama i'll look you up yeah of course uh you have to uh, and also, hopefully, we'll see each other at some of these uh, biometrics conferences. I don't think I've seen you around so far, but we've had a few come around. Were you at the North American uh, Menseratius meeting that was in uh, Portland? No, I wasn't to that one. No, I, love, I tend to go to a lot of the, not so much the Menseratius ones, but the, uh, the latest one was the North American uh, conference that was held in Fredericton toward Ramsoff. So it was great wow. reconnecting with some people. Yeah. That I hadn't seen from Rainier in the past and, and whatnot. So uh, yeah, well, definitely hope to to see you around. Uh, we're gonna end this. Hang on a minute. We'll have a conversation. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>